Welcome to the Popcorn Talk Network. For the online broadcast network that features movie discussion, news, and interviews, press one. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. From the Popcorn Talk Network, the online broadcast network for movie talk, this is Adult Films Exposed. In-depth discussion and interviews with members of the adult film industry. Happy Hump Day! Welcome to Adult Films Exposed. If you have not already, make sure you subscribe to Adult Films Exposed on YouTube and iTunes. I'm your host, Yelt Eagle. I'm so excited. Today we have Lexington Steel. What's Yay. up? What's going on? Thanks Welcome. for having me. Um, all right, let's start from the way, way beginning. All right. You were um, you were working on Wall Street. Yeah. You were in finance. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> How did you get from there to where we are today? Oh, it was really simple. Um, you know, when I got out of college, I went into immediately as a broker trainee into a firm that was literally located on Wall Street. And um, once I became licensed, um, I was introduced to um, so show us say recreational activities mm -hmm. that the other brokers participated in that if you were a broker trainee you weren't privy to and so um, there I had one of those parties those type of parties um, I met somebody that got me involved in ultimately involved in adult magazines this was I was simultaneously a broker um, and then I went on to do um, videos in out of the Bronx a company out of the Bronx New York uh, gave me the opportunity from there um, I said, look, I said, I could always return to corporate or finance within two years because my licensing was going to expire mm -hmm. uh, within two years if you aren't effectively affecting trades. And so I knew I had a two year window. I said, if I can't make it, I'll know soon enough as a male performer, you find out very quickly whether you can do it or not. I had been doing it in New York. So by the time I said, look, I can give myself a chance to go to California. And um, and I had some some preparation, some, uh, you know, some experience. And so I said, let me give myself a chance. And um, um, I was you know, thankful to have to have made it, you know, and yeah. got established. Although I will say special thanks to Chris Alexander and Sue Alexander, um, Biff Malibu and Buffy Malibu of, of back in the day porno, um, the owner, the co-owners of Anabolic mm -hmm. Video that uh, are responsible for really, really giving me the confidence and the chance to, uh, to really make a mark. Cause, um, I failed for them the first time I worked for them. What and does that mean? I bombed. I bombed. And it was like my second scene on the day. I was too, you know, really new, wet behind the ears. It was my second scene on the day for one of the greatest companies in the world at that time. And um, I blew it. Mm -hmm. But um, they liked me enough to ask me to stay for dinner. And I stayed for dinner. And three hours later, they were like, well, look, you know what? You sound like a, a good guy. You had off day today, we'll give you another chance. And then my shooting for them the second time is what put me on the mark because they were like a powerhouse company at the time. So becoming one of their guys is what really established me um, from the very beginning. That's amazing. So you went from doing just photos for magazines, right? right. Mm -hmm. And were those like solo photos or photos with people? Well, you, uh, both cases. Um, I did boy girl um, softcore and boy girl hardcore for a number of magazines that were published in New York, primarily um, um, black magazines, whether it was uh, Black Tail or Black Lust. Um, as a matter of fact, I also did a solo male layout in a magazine called Black Inches, of which I was literally Mr. March of 1997. <laughs> <laughs> Believably, but true. That's so funny. Um, so what was your first film? Do you remember what it was called? No. Because, well, the first film, no, I can't recall that. Um, it was shot by a company called Caesar Video, mm -hmm. and Caesar Video was a company out of the Bronx, New York, by Charles Stone, was the owner and proprietor, along with his wife. And um, so I don't remember what that first title was. Um, you know, because the titles go by the wayside. It's more or less the people you work with or the people you work for mm -hmm. that make an imprint. So you've worked, it sounds like a lot of them are couples that are making these films together. Well, well, it's just a notion that if, if the, you know, if the figurehead is a, a man or the figurehead is a, is a female, 
either way, in most, in a lot of cases, their spouse is involved in the companies. And, and whether or not that spouse is um, in the office on a day-to-day -day basis, they generally do work together as part of the, or one of their businesses that they may have together. So in that case with Anabolic, as well as a number of companies, um, the, the husband and wife, um, or brother and sister, if you look at Vivid, you know, yeah. the, the to the Hirsch brother and sisters, you know, Stephen and Marcy. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's another partner, but it's just a notion that um, it is a really a family-run business in most cases. <laughs> it's a mom and pop shop. <laughs> it can be mom and pop, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I know, let's jump ahead. Uh -huh. You're producing and making your own stuff now. Oh yeah, for some time now. And you, you aren't working with a, you don't have a partner, a spouse. Uh, no, no. <laughs> um, mm. So let's talk about the stuff that you're making. Yeah. Um, well, okay, we'll get there. Let's talk about, let's talk about <laughs> no doubt. what made you decide to go from performing to the other side of the camera? Um, you know, when I started doing movies, um, my first scene was April of 97. You remember um, the dates? Oh, yeah. April April 13th, 1997 was my first scene. <laughs> Wait, so the dates are more important than the title of the movie? Yeah, the title I wouldn't remember. I, I wouldn't amazing. remember. Oh, you know, it's I remember the titles of movies that I own personally, but mm -hmm. I don't remember the titles of movies that I shoot for other people. Interesting. Yeah. Well, because you're also, you're, you studied history, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, that has nothing to do with porno. I mean, <laughs> no, that's, that's just memory. <laughs> that's why yeah, you remember yeah, yeah, yeah. the date of everything. Right, you know, I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so April. April 97 was yeah. my first scene. Um, and uh, uh, from there. Um, you started doing other stuff. I mean, gosh, I mean, you know, April 97 through, and I didn't go to, come out to LA till December. December of 97 was my first trip to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I shot for a director by the name of Michael Raven, who shot for Wicked Pictures. And a um, great dude out of Dallas. And he had a beautiful wife named Sydney Steele. And we worked together um, for one of his productions. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, so you start making movies, you, you become one of the biggest names. Mm -hmm in the industry and you decide you want to make your own production company. Right. Why? Well, you know, you, well, here's the thing, mm -hmm. you know, when I got into the industry and, 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 you know, not for nothing, but I for, I lost my train of thought as to the, the question that led up to that question yeah. as far as why to become a director. Mm -hmm. Oh, very simply is this, um, the creation of, of, of the product is something that is, is more interesting to, to me than than actual sex, because if once I found that I liked this whole industry in terms of just being a viewer, mm -hmm. everybody that watches wants to become a director. Like, I know I can produce the best stuff. Well, the thing about it is, you know, you, there's a lot more to directing a movie than most most people think. Mm -hmm. But I fell in love with that, and and so it motivated me to to become good as a director. And I. I I have as many avian awards as a director as I have as a performer, mm -hmm. um, and people don't know that, but it, but it's actually true. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just a notion that I can put together a project right, twenty four hours a day, multiple days a week. Uh, but when you're having sex, you're only having sex for a small window of time, maybe maybe two hours, right? If you're shooting on one day. So if I'm doing a scene two hours that's two hours of sex but i can work on my projects for the other you know 22 hours in the day mm -hmm. you know i don't sleep much either i'm like a, i'm like a vampire but <laughs> you know what i'm saying but but like i'll put i would say i would give the 20 hours I, a, a day that I, I have running my businesses mm -hmm. um over the two hours for sex wow. any day of the week because because i mean you know you can only have sex with for so long yeah. <laughs> and orgasm <laughs> is like what 10 to 15 seconds, yeah, give or take yeah. a 10 second <laughs> <laughs> differential. <No. laughs> well, so, okay, so you enjoy directing and producing. Yeah. So why not uh, direct and produce mainstream film as well? Uh, because they're, they're two different um, crafts okay. and, and out of respect for mainstream media, um, I'm not familiar with the production of that. Um, I specialize in the production of, of adult media. 
Um, but one of my specialties is uh, is broadcasting. So I do have um, I've gotten into the broadcasting field with right. production uh, productions uh, within that environment. But as far as producing a, a, a talk show, or I produce talk shows. Mm-hmm. I don't produce TV shows per se or right. movies. Um, I leave that up to the pros because I, I would much rather watch them and their expertise and I know that they enjoy what I do. So it's kind of like I stay in my lane because there's far greater directors in, in adult media mm-hmm. that I'm still trying to catch up with. Right. So I have I still have a number of people that I look up to that are directors that I'm trying to produce something um, competitively with what they're putting out. Yeah. That's so wonderful. Yeah. And I think it's, it's such a, a rare thing to be able to say, you know what, I've got this amazing skill and I'm going to hone it and make it the best that yeah. I can. Where I feel like most people try to, they're like, I'm doing really well. Let's see what I can do next. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really admirable. Thank I think you. it's wonderful. Uh, so let's talk about the making of a film. Right. So when you, what is the first part of you, you're going to make a project? First thing is what guys I'm going to use. Oh, that is first. If it's, if it's, if it's in addition to myself. Okay. And then what happens? Because <laughs> I'm using most of the stuff that I produce. Um, <laughs> and then after that, um, are you in most of your own work? Uh, most of the stuff that I that I own personally mm-hmm. since about 2012, I've been doing what we call signature series, where it's one person that's working in the different scenarios, but one person is the baseline for all the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, there's very few male performers that that. Um, that can sell commercially um, signature series. Um, so these are like the Lex series, though. Well, anything. Well, most mercenary pictures titles, my which is my one, my original company, my second company is Lexus Hill Productions. Mm-hmm. My second studio, all the stuff is pretty much um, the top dudes. But I'm in everything, you know. And okay. so what's happening now, as I direct for companies other than Mercenary or Lexus Hill Productions. Um, I'm actually beginning to shoot, or going back to what I used to do, was shoot uh, moves that I'm not in completely, that I'm okay. completely not in. Mm-hmm. And there's another strategy with that as well, but, um, you know, it's usually what guys are gonna use. Um, then I wanna look at the comprisals of the scenes that I need for the movie, mm-hmm. given the genre, and then I'll select the the, uh, the ladies for the so- movie. Before you select the guys that you want to use, you have an idea of what the the premise yeah. is. Yes. Okay. And do you do you use a script? Is there a script? No, not with my stuff. Um, you know, and and not taking anything away from the guys that write scripts. I personally enjoy doing feature movies when the opportunity presents itself. But mm-hmm. as far as Gonzo, I don't think there's a necessity for a script in Gonzo. What we do, um, my co-director is a. a a great guy by the name of um, Kevin Moore Mm -hmm. and um, he's my partner in in Lexus Hill Productions and um, what we do for our Evil Angel product um, we generally come up with, we'll we'll know that the series that we're shooting with will be whether it's MILF, um, POV um, All Black Mm -hmm. um, All Anal these different micro genres right? right? Um, It's always going to be, we'll think about the scenario right before we shoot it and that that way it's not only there's no pressure because you haven't been thinking about it all day. Generally, we're just trying to find a way to get to the sex mm-hmm. without without rushing it, but by the same time, um, adding a little uh, comedic relief if we can. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So let's. I want to compare a few films that you've been uh, part of. Okay. So you were part of the Avengers parody. Yes. And the sequel. Yeah. Um, from Vivid, you also did the Fresh Out of the Box films series. Yes. Which you produced. I produced and owned that. That was shot by a good friend of mine, Tina Tyler, who was one of the, not only one of the greatest female performers, but she's also one of the greatest female directors. Are there a lot of female directors? Um, you know, there there aren't, but but the few that, that are are very, very good because it's a very competitive you know, business in mm-hmm. terms of everybody's trying to compete for the same dollars, right? Yeah. And there are fewer fewer studios now producing. So the women that are directing right now are, are very, 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 very good and, and, and are in their positions, not because they're women, but just because they're great directors. I mean, if you look at, um, um, you know, there's like four or five. Um, Mason is like probably one of the best directors in Gonzo right now, mm-hmm. you know, on par 
with um, the very best of them. So yeah, well, so okay, so for the Avengers porn parody. Mm -hmm. There was there a script for that one? Oh yeah, heavily yeah. heavily scripted because that was a big time feature. Right, and then for Fresh Out of the Box, no script. Well, no, because Fred, the premise of Fresh Out of Number One, Fresh Out of the Box was a totally different type of move, type right. of porn, where it's feature versus Gonzo. Right. So within Gonzo, the um, the the niche within Gonzo is brand new girls. Mm -hmm. So we were shooting girls that were within their first or second scene, literally, first, second, third scene, first week. Yeah. Thusly, thusly, fresh out the box. Right. Right. And um, so, you know, and since the girls were so new, we really, you know, what Tina did, she really didn't want to have them do a lot of dialogue because mm -hmm. they were so new to being on film. So what she did is really just celebrate the, the, the fresh newness of that new girl. Because okay. most times the girl might be like 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly not 18 at least, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 18, 19, 20. So what she did is really celebrate the fact that they were brand new right. and that Mercer Pictures directed by Tina Tyler was bringing it out to the uh, the the consumers. So let's talk about a budget on a film mm -hmm. like Avengers versus um, Fresh Out of the Box series. Mm -hmm. um, is it safe to assume that Avengers had a bigger budget? Oh my God, I mean, exponentially greater, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, we, uh, um, with what we do, um, I would give, a, you know, I would put a budget anywhere between, mm, Fifteen to twenty thousand, and uh, whereas what Axel Axel Braun, mm -hmm. who used to direct for Vivid, now is a um, exclusive Wicked Pictures director, yeah. um, his budgets may exceed a quarter of a million dollars. Wow! Yeah. And so how many? How long do you have to make a film like Avengers? Oh, I wouldn't know. I mean, Axel probably because um, I don't I don't direct or produce features. Right. How so. long were you part of that uh, team? Um, well, you know, the good thing about it is, you know, Axel is, is a great director. And, mm -hmm. and I also, you know, count him as a friend. And, and our relationship is such that if he has a particular campaign that he's doing um, and he says, hey, that would be, you know, a lot of times like that will be good for Lex. Now, some some of the things that I get involved in, whether it's Nick Fury within the Avengers right. or um, we did a Star Wars, Star Wars. Or Darth Vader, yeah. um, you know, he's like, hey, I got something for you. Um, and he, he, he only comes to me with big, with big jobs, you know? Um, so, you know, we just keep, you know, whatever he comes up with, uh, yeah. if, if he's got something for me, and I'm, I'm always interested because not enough opportunities, uh, present themselves for, for men of color, um, in the feature, in the feature mm -hmm. movies. So, um, while they're few and far between, ironically enough, um, I've been a screen actor, a member of the Screen Actors Guild since 2008. For what I've done in mainstream yeah. Um, movies and TV, yeah, and it's 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 interesting that um, uh, if you look at how few uh, roles I have had as an as a dialogue um, carrying um, leading man in in an adult. Right. So, for Fresh Out of the Box, how big of a crew do you have for one of the movies in that series? Well, I mean, and not for nothing, but that's that's been a very long time since I produced that mm -hmm. series. I okay. mean, you know, um, Tina moved back to Canada back in 2010. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you know the, the formulation of something then uh, relative to today would be right. quite different. So um, what she was doing, um, it would be herself as a photographer, Mm -hmm. uh, shooting the glamour pictures before the scene and right. videographer, and uh, and then generally we would always have the addition of one assistant. So the the crews are 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 in no way comparable to what you would see right. in a feature production. Wow, that's just so amazing to to see. There's such a difference in the different, yeah. not just the different you know um, micro genres, but also mm -hmm. in the different styles and. It's just oh, so fascinating. Well, well, Gonzo, you know, <laughs> what well, Gonzo directors really have to wear many hats. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I'm when I'm shooting, um, you know, I I hire out of a photographer because I'm not the best photographer, but I'm a skillful videographer. So if I'm not performing, I'll be on the camera. But I'll you know I'll I'll have a good photographer shoot my stills. Some directors. Um, Kevin Moore, for instance, uh, Jules Jordan, these guys are really good at photography, videography as well. Mm -hmm. And so they don't need, you know, a lot of assistance. Now, right. with the features, the projects are so 
huge by comparison they need crews of x amount of people right. to handle so many of the different things that they have going on yeah i mean i might only shoot in one room of a house of a, of a, of a production location whereas they may use you know 11 of 12 rooms mm -hmm. in a mansion for their productions and how how often are our um films shot in a house versus on like a sound stage or something um you know 100 percent of my stuff is usually shot in a house Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, um, now there are some studios that have really, really comfortable sets, and so they, it could be on a soundstage, but I would say uh, about 90% of Gonzo are shot in residential homes throughout um, here in the Valley, Southern California. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So you never know which house has stuff going on in no, it. No, <laughs> exactly, because believe me, like when I try and squeeze in a scene at my house, in my neighborhood, it's, it's kind of sketchy. Because um, it's a, it's you know where I live, there's a lot of kids and mm -hmm. you know families, and so um, I know that you know I can only shoot between say like 10 a.m. and 3 mm, 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. at the latest. That mm -hmm. window allows for my talent to get in and out without kids, roam, you know, that might be around yeah. and, and or being able to hear what's taking place. Um, I love so you want to be aware of that. I love that you said that it's super sketchy because there are children. Yeah. Whereas when someone usually says sketchy, you think of like the uh, it would be the opposite i just think that is amazing <laughs> um so let's talk a little bit about uh when you are casting yeah what does an audition look like for the men that you're bringing in that you might not be familiar in for familiar the with? for the men for the men that you cast um you know I, I don't really cast my guys um um the way i cast the females okay. uh, most of the guys i i've shot it's kind of like when I, when I spoke about becoming a member of Anabolic's team, one mm -hmm. of their guys. Yeah. What that means is, um, you know, you have, as a director, you'll have the guys that you use with regularity. I am one of Axel Braun's guys. Okay. When he needs uh, when he needs a black guy for a primary role, he thinks of me first. And can I fit that particular role for him? Um, in my case, I generally shoot um, interracial um, black male to white female or black male to Latino or Asian mm -hmm. as well as black on black. But my guys are always um, primarily black guys with individuals because what my, what my specialty is. And mm -hmm. so I've been shooting these guys for a number of years. It's difficult to make my squad, so to speak, because you, you have to prove yourself better than the guys I've been using. Right. And, and, and ultimately, um, it's one of my greatest challenges is because when as a as a producer because when I remove myself ultimately when I stop performing yeah my movies have to be um, remain commercially viable and so the challenge for me ironically enough is the fact that I have to sow the seeds of my own replacement yeah such that my label still maintains this brand value See what I'm saying? Well, so yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know, to make my squad is 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 exponentially more important for other reasons than people realize. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when I stop performing, people need to remember, yeah, still mercenary pictures or Lexus Hill Productions, good dudes. That's gotta be really hard to to be like, Oh yeah, I could see him taking yeah. my place. Yeah. That's gotta yeah. be so awkward. No, it's not awkward because you know, the thing about it is it's a necessity. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had my run. Um, this is my 17th year. Um, you know, I, I've won three Male Performer of the Year awards, um, Hall of Fame in 2009, yeah. and you know, I've been nominated f for Best Male Performer. I've been in the running 14 of my 17 years, wow. including the last three. So even at the tail end of my performance career, mm -hmm. I'm going to be exiting at the top of my game, right? Yeah. But there's other good dudes that are, are that are fitfully will, will will replace me within my own productions. And they're also good friends of mine too. And I can trust them, I can trust them with my money. Mm -hmm. Because the thing about it is like, a lot of companies didn't shoot me until they were confident that if they said, okay, I'm gonna book a girl that costs them an amount of money, right. then they wanna pull in a guy that's gonna come in and blow the scene, they still gotta pay the girl. Yeah, And so, um, um, yeah, so I, you know, I learned very well how to put together a squad of dudes and um you know definitely to make my squads tough but if you make the squad you're working for any of my productions with regularity yeah mm -hmm. so how do you cast the women well well you know depending on the movie mm -hmm. you know if it's a movie i have a series called um well i have a series called you know 
uh, MILF magnet, right? Mm-hmm. You know, playing upon the words of, you know, MILF, you know, mother, I like to fuck magnet. Yeah. So MILF magnet was my first uh, MILF um, series. And then now I have Lex is a motherfucker. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so generally, I don't shoot girls that represent MILFs that are too young and don't fitfully um, define the, right. the, the, the term MILF. I mean, I'm not going to shoot a 22-year-old girl just because she could be somebody's mom. Right. I'll shoot a 32-year-old girl. Primarily, I like to shoot a 42-year-old girl. Mm-hmm. Right? Because you know, the quintessential MILF is not younger than 40 years old. Please believe. Right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Stifler's mom right. was over 40, people. <laughs> And so was Miss. And so was um, um, Mrs. Robinson. No, 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 not Miss Robinson. <laughs> no, nah, but Miss Cosby. Yeah. Claire Huxtable was over forty. And, and for those for those people that appreciate her as a milf, um, <laughs> that predated Stifler's mom. Yeah. You know. So. Um, so that's why I pick the girls. It's appropriate for the series that I'm shooting. If I have a series called uh, Pretty Young Things and, and, and pre- Lex Poles Small Holes, mm-hmm. Pretty Young Things. Um, it's kind of like my fresh out of the box here is where right. I'm shooting girls that are within their first few scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also they're petite. Now, now quite honestly, um, many people that are familiar with my brand know that I don't specialize in petite women. Um, so, so, you know, I shoot that series few and far between, but when I'm shooting those series, I'll shoot a petite girl, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a pixie type right. girl. Um, Lex likes them thick. Um, is primarily series I'll shoot with a girl that's that's, um, you know, more curvaceous. Mm-hmm. You know, I I I like big breasts and I can't lie. lie. <laughs> well, actually, I like big butts that I can't lie. lie. Why well, switch it up? I like big tits, right? Yeah. I'm a tits and ass man, but I primarily like tits. So I have a breast series, girls with big boobs. Mm-hmm. I don't make a distinction um, between whether they're real or implants. As long as they look good and look big, right. I believe the guys, you know, jerk off to um, um, real tits or or implants. The same, you know, just big tits. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it just depends on what the series is, and um, and then what type of girls are hot now mm-hmm. in the moment. Um, and and you know, you and now you can actually research a girl at your fingertips. I mean, you know, yeah. within minutes you can you can see whether or not you want to shoot her. Not only what she looks like right but you can actually go and find out how she performs mm-hmm. and, you know literally i'll be on the phone and um you know do you know when someone says hey do you want to shoot this girl and i'll be like, okay let me have a look at her i'll look at her pictures and i'll go see some of the work she's done and i can be like okay yeah let's do it so it kind of cuts out the audition process altogether because you can just well yeah up. like you know um i actually had a, a very nice office in uh here in the valley for for over 10 years and um we used to have what's called go sees where mm-hmm. the um the talent managers would bring the the um the girls by the office and we'd actually meet them in person uh and chat briefly now that's been totally eradicated because the websites of the talent agencies are so so well put together mm-hmm that you don't even have to see them in person because the stills, the pictures that you see on the site, um, they're shot in such a way that you can say, okay, this is a way that the girl would look if I shot her. Mm -hmm. And so they they make the picture so that you can say, okay, this is the way she'll look after the type of makeup that we do for our business. As opposed to posting up a picture of a girl from, you know, maybe a picture she took for a test shoot for Vogue magazine, right? High Mm -hmm. glamour. That's not the way we want her to look. The agencies now know to shoot the girl in triple X, you know, uh, through a triple X, you know, lens lens if you will yeah. right so i heard in an interview that you had said that um you know th- there was discussion about with the internet how uh you know it kind of seems like dvd sales aren't doing so well and mm-hmm. you had said that um for powerful studios dvd numbers have not diminished with the rise mm-hmm. of internet clips can you talk a little bit about that well, well you know internet piracy has something has been um really impactful and it's it sunk many ships um, within this industry, you know, um, you know, Mercenary Pictures, my company, uh, suffered heavily from um, from online piracy. And online piracy is really expensive to police, mm-hmm. you know. And you can spend a lot of spend a lot of money, and and yes, the cease and desist will have the guy take the, take it down. But two days later, it's right back up again, right? So I had been impacted heavily by it. But when I launched Lexus Steel Productions with Evil Angel, what I realized is that. 
the impact on the powerhouse studios and my mercenary was a small boot is is a small boutique boutique um uh studio mm-hmm. and uh in no way comparable to an evil angel so when i launched my new company which is distributed by evil angel right. i realized that the bigger companies, while they had a tremendous impact to their bottom line, their brand was able to more handily sustain the impact that that virtually sunk, you know, my boat would not necessarily sink their ship. Yeah. So it isn't a case where um, DVD sales are bottomed out for everybody. Right. They certainly not. They are certainly impacted, but. Um, if you look at what the big guys are doing, they're the big guys for a reason, and um, I'm just happy that my my newest studio is in line with, with Evil Angel. Right. So let's talk about other things that come with adult films, yeah. like toys. Mm. So there is a toy line based off of you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what? How did? How are these? Where did they come from? How are they made? Explain oh, how man. toys are made. All right. Well. You mean literally? Kind of. Okay. I want to know <laughs> what you do um, in the process of making. All right. So what toys. happens is is they you know is is really medical almost right. Yeah. So they they put you in a you have a gown on. They put you on a table. They roll you into this all white, really clean. Um, I mean, like seriously clean. Like an MRI machine. Right? Yeah. No. 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 Not something. That, just a big room yeah. that's very very clean, very sterile. And what happens is. Um, you know, they give you some time to get your erection. Now you have to be able to maintain the erection for twelve to fifteen minutes, which which can be challenging in the absence of of the miracles of modern medicine, if you will. Mm-hmm. So when I did this, um, when I made my toy, my girlfriend at the time came with me um, because that was really you know there really wasn't the, ex- the there wasn't such access to the ED drugs so mm-hmm. i mean getting hard on and maintaining for 12 to 15 minutes was difficult when i when i made my mold so my girlfriend literally came in and talk was talking shit to me mm-hmm. literally squatted over my face and i literally was eating her eating her pussy to maintain my excitability mm-hmm. and what they do and the the two people come in the room and they have full body suits because the problem is, is like they don't want to get um, any type of uh, irregular irregularity in the mold. Mm-hmm. So the mold looks like a, a flower pot with a hole with a hole in it. Okay. So they put the flower pot over your erection, mm-hmm. all the way to the base, including your balls. Mm-hmm. So one person is holding the flower pot, and the other person is placing your penis through the hole and grabbing your nutsack. I hope that was a female that was grabbing my nutsack, yeah, because <laughs> there was a man and woman that came in. Right, and then so the woman is holding your. I'll say, let's just say the. Woman. So the woman is holding your, your your your. We can we can say these words. Yeah, of course. Right? So the woman's holding your dick like this. Yeah. And then the guy is pouring the mold, pouring the the substance, the mold okay. material into the pot, and it's really cold. Okay. In actuality, it really is cold. Um, and and as it begins to harden, it contracts. Okay. Now, so if you can just maintain a very strong hard on until it begins to con- contract, then you're in pretty good shape. As it contracts, the air is forced out, and they have fans that are actually sucking the air out of the room in order to continue to vacuum pack that mold. Okay. Okay. So it took me two times um, because the first time I couldn't maintain my hard on well enough for them to get a good mold mm-hmm. and had to redo it. And um. Did you redo it like the same day, like right, right after? Right, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, the problem was is they realized they didn't have a good seal mm-hmm. because I began losing my my you know rigidity, and so they actually were able to release the mold before it hardened. Now the second time around, I was good to go. They had a really good seal, and the mold was going to be a very good mold. Now the next problem is this: so the two people come back in the room. The one person unwraps the flower pot, mm-hmm. which I believe was the female, and then the guy will take the mold at the very base and then from then begin to pull up the oh, mold okay. virtually unwrapping the mold yeah. from your penis. Now, I, ladies and gentlemen, look, I just want to tell you that I wish my dick was as long as I saw it that day <laughs> because I didn't know that my dick was actually that long. <laughs> you know, it's remarkable um, the stretchability that we have mm. with the, in, in parts of our body and yeah. um, I was shocked to see that um, I was like, wow, if you can only stay like that, I would be, you know, a gazillion, a billionaire in this business. No, just playing with that. But um, <laughs> but it, it, was, it hurt, 
you know, not the actual mold, but the re the removal right. of the mold was very painful, and um, it was crazy to see how well you can stretch your skin stretches. Yeah, it's remarkable. Wow. Well, thank yeah. you for sharing that story. <laughs> that's um, how. Yeah. So that's how they make them. I I've, I've been dying to know how those yeah. are made. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. And you you have said I think one of my favorite quotes of yours. I've been blessed with a physical attribute that I'm able to turn into a commercially successful business venture. Right. Which is I think. A, an amazing way to look at it mm -hmm. and, and really a wonderful statement um, and you had talked about your parents yeah and how they're aware and that it wasn't a such a big deal when you talked to them because you were an adult yeah very much and so. they understood that mm -hmm. um, but that they were confused because they thought that you had maybe not confused but they they had assumed that you were doing the late night Cinemax as mm -hmm. you said the single X uh, yeah. films can we talk a little bit about uh, the difference between what they imagined you were doing and what you were actually doing? Ah, uh, well, okay. So when I left um, the business world to get mm -hmm. into adult, right? You know, my father was fully aware of what I was doing, as far as like he knew that I was leaving the business world to go into hardcore movies. I mean, okay. he, he was very familiar with hardcore movies. Um, uh, yeah, he, he asked me if I, you know, are you sure, you know, right. um, but he knew that he hadn't paid any of my bills or I hadn't asked him for any money since I graduated from college. So he knew that I was not only a grown ass man, but I was all, very much on my own. Right. My mother, she thought that, okay, I'm going to California, the proverbial, you know, going to Hollywood to become a movie star. Well, she thought that I was going to be doing, you know, HBO or Showtime you know what I'm saying? The, mm -hmm. the late night stuff, um, post 11 p.m. material. Because right. she's seen, she, you know, she has seen that on, on cable TV. Yeah. I mean, who has if you're watching TV after 11 o'clock? Right. And especially back at that time, um, you know, when I started back in, in, when I came out to L.A., was 98. So what they didn't know, per se, is I had been doing since 90, you know, mid-96, mm -hmm. early 96. So when I was leaving to L.A., my dad knew that it w I wasn't going to go out there without having had some experience. Right. My mother t had no idea. And so mm -hmm. it was her first introduction to my participating in something that was only going to be shown for adults only. Right. So what happened was, um, um, you know, at the time, Avian was showing the... Um, um, I think they had the award show on TV or something, but I won my first male performer of the year award. Right. And uh, someone had told my mother that um, essentially I had won an Oscar. And she was like, well, how could he have won an Oscar when he's been out there for a couple of years but he hasn't done shit? <laughs> and they were like, no, no, no. Well, he, he won an equivalent of an Oscar, right. which was AVN. So she called me on the phone. She was like, hey, so they said, you know, one of my friends said you won some type of award. What's the deal? I said, well, mom, you know, the, t the stuff I do is not what you're seeing on TV. Right. And she said, what do you mean? I said, look, the media that, not to use those words, but the movies that I make are are only available on VHS. Mm -hmm. This is pre-DVD, essentially. Right. But essentially VHS and DVD. And there was like this long pause on the phone, and then you hear, oh. <laughs> like, the realization yeah. was like, you do those movies. And then essentially she just was like, okay. And she said two things. She said, don't get sick. Um, and don't get anyone pregnant um, unless you plan to. And I've done neither. So yeah. it's worked out pretty well. It has worked out pretty yeah. well. Um, well, thank you so much for coming here yeah. and talking to us. Um, I know that you also host a few shows. Yeah. Why don't you tell people where they can listen to you and find you online? Okay. Um, well, on Monday nights, um, you can watch the Lex and Steel live show. Mm -hmm. And Lex and Steel live airs on www.latalkradio.com on the video channel. And you can watch it. Um, it's Monday nights, um, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific. And it's also archived on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. um, Tuesday night, and that's more like that. Lex Live is more like a Howard Stern type of show mm -hmm. um, featuring adult guests, uh, comedians, actors. Tuesday night um, is Fourth and Goal Sports Talk. And Fourth and Goal will play on the football yeah. ad is Fourth and Goal. Um, which is all sports, no triple X. Um, that's on www.chocolateradio.net. And once again, that's another video mm -hmm. um, show that you watch and view. And that's archived not only on chocolateradio.net, but um, you can watch it live on Ustream, listen to it on Live 365. You can even um, uh, watch it on PlayStation 4, as awesome. a matter of fact. 
And then Thursday, I'm back on LA Talk Radio video channel um, with a show called The Man Cave Live. And The Man Cave Show uh, airs Thursday nights, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. Pacific on latalkradio.com video channel. And that's more socioeconomic and political uh, uh, conjecture and debate. Yeah. Um, so the, the cool thing about the, the, the mainstream initiative that, that I'm involved in is that only one of my three shows involve adult media and context. Right. Um, which is something that is really important because people are seeing that um, the same guy is hosting an all sports talk show mm -hmm. or we might have a whole show that's dedicated completely to ISIS right. or or the you know the new agreement with Iran and, you know tomorrow we'll be discussing heavily the shooting death of an unarmed um, victim in South Carolina mm -hmm. um, tomorrow night on the man cave right. so you know there's a lot of stuff um, other than triple X I just want to show people like hey we do more than just you know we're not we're more than cock jockeys yeah you, yeah. you also have a very, very uh, smart brain. Oh, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and you're using it. That's so yeah. great. Thank you so much. Why don't you tell people also where they can find you on Twitter? Oh, follow me at LexSteel11 on Twitter. That's L-E-X-S-T-W-E-L-E-11 -E -E um, on Twitter and Lexin.Steel on Instagram. And Lexin Steel Black Viking on Facebook. And there's a lot of imposters out there, people. So be very discerning when deciding... Um, which Lex Steel you're actually following. In most cases, you'll know it's me by the pictures that include uh, my personal life and my production movies, uh, production pictures as well. Um, you'll be able to tell the difference if you just pay attention. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. And of course, you got to follow Adult Films Exposed on Twitter. That's AFX uh, Bosed. P-O-S-E-D. Also, I'm Yael Teagle. I'm on Twitter at Yael Teagle, Y-A-E-L-T-Y-G-I-E-L. -E -E Let us know who you want to see next here with the hashtag AFXNext. See ya. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit PopcornTalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.